So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Hey Frank, look at my new Bible. This is not a Bible. This is a Bible. <sighs> Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. And when I see that they attack the Word of God like this, it just gets the better part of me. And I'm refraining from saying certain words because a lot of this stuff is satanic, if you ask me. I'd like to officially welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, noten veshomeret varech, lelamed leyadrik hut leyanhot otanu, bederek sheba alenu lelechet alei deit pechat aneinu, ozaneinu vilevno. למען תמסור לנו מרחמתך, יד יתרה ודבונתך, בנירת נפלאות מתורתך. שרוע הקודש שלחה תנחה את כולנו אל כל האמת, ברכת לימוד המילה אליך בשם ישוע. Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the Universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go, by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us unto all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. When I did this Bible study back almost eight years ago, which was back in 2015, I took from 2000 to 2015, and I saw all the new versions that had come out. There was approximately 75 of them. How much versions do you need for us to actually understand the English language? And if all these versions are coming out, it's because there's dollar signs. The amount of Bibles that are sold is crazy. So does the English language change that much in 15 years that the language becomes obsolete, that we have to change and we need a brand new Bible? Is English really that hard to understand that we need five versions per year to stay in touch with the English language? And you know that that's not true. So how fast is the English language being antiquated or outdated? So approximately every 2.4 months, the English language needs an update for all these versions to come out. I don't think it's written stupid on my forehead. So between you and me, we know what it is. Ah yes, it's the holy buck that's actually driving this machine. I'm going to give you one example, okay? This version is very popular and let's go for a test run. It's called the New Living Translation, the NLT. Now notice the wording in promoting this Bible. This is what they have on their website when you go check it out. About the NLT, the New Living Translation. The Holy Bible, now they should take holy out of it, but anyways, the Holy Bible, the New Living Translation, is an authoritative Bible translation rendered faithfully into today's language. Underline that, make that bold, today's English from the ancient text by 90 leading biblical scholars. Remember that because we're going to go through another exercise. Remember these biblical scholars. The NLT's living language breeds life even into the most difficult to understand Bible passages. Now I have a question. How can you breathe life into even the most difficult to understand passages? That one I never understood. First of all, the statement doesn't make sense at all. What does this statement even mean? I would like to see somebody prove that the NLT is actually going to make me understand those hard to understand passages. I'm going to go back to their quote. But even more powerful are stories of how people's lives are changing as the words speak directly to their hearts. Make me understand, by reading your NLT, my life is going to change. Wow, I thought it was the Word of God that actually did that and not the version itself. And also, what does people's lives have to do with translating a Bible? Going back to their quote, the NLT second edition was put together by a dream team, remember this, a dream team of scholars and linguists and gives us a Bible that is thoroughly reliable and imminently readable. What, the other Bibles, the other 17 million Bibles out there, they're not readable? They are readable. So look at the words. I mean, it's a psychological war game that these guys are playing. It allows the scriptures to speak with fresh vitality. Really? And that's why they call it new. Now the mention of this dream team of the scholars and linguists is to throw sparkles in your eyes. Oh wow, it's like you know you have a dream team of whatever sport or uh, O.J. Simpson, he had a dream team of lawyers, now you have a dream team of translators. What method did the translators use in making the NLT? The translators of the New Living Translation set out to render the message of the original text. Stop here for a sec. The original text don't exist. I would like to see one person produce a scrap of the original, the first time that somebody penned something down on the materials that they were actually writing on. When somebody says, in the originals it says, 
Get up, get out, the guy's lying to your face. And if he's lying over here, he's going to be lying down the line later. The originals don't exist. We have copies of copies of copies. So to pick it up again, so they set out to render the message of the original text, which don't exist, of scripture into clear contemporary English. Remember those words. As they did so, they translated as simply and literally as possible when the approach yielded an accurate, clear, and natural English text. What the hell is a natural English text? You see the words that they're using in their marketing materials. This is to wow the people. It's to sort of like dazzle them. Says, oh wow, this must be an amazing Bible. But it's not in the end. So most of the translators of this NLT are professors in seminaries or universities. So notice their grade where they're at. And all the translators have written books and or scholarly articles regarding the specific books of the Bible for which they did their translation work. By reading this, you have confidence that you have a solid Bible in front of you put together by these good, smart people, right? Never having met any of these guys and you see all of their credentials, you put your faith and trust in these guys. This is what marketing material does. You have the trust that they never earned, by the way, in men who put a book together that you're going to base your life on. So they gave you a book called the Bible, you're going to be putting your life in the hands of this book that they translated. So I'm going to go back to the quote now. They represent, these translators, a rich variety of theological and denominational backgrounds, united by the common conviction that the Bible is God's Word, and that all people should have a translation of Scripture that they can really understand. What? The other Bibles nobody understands. There's a problem now here. I'm going to go back to their quote. Using modern English, look at the words they're using. The translators of the NLT focused on producing clarity in the meaning of the text, rather than creating a literal word-for-word -word equivalence. Their goal was to create a clear, readable translation while remaining faithful to the original text that don't exist, by the way. Enough of this psychological manipulation. They say that the proof is in the pudding. So let's see how clear of a job these people do in translating the Bible into readable English. So if you own an NLT, please do yourself a favor, pull it out and go through every verse that I'm going to be mentioning. I want you to see it with your own eyes. So what we're going to be looking at, these next set of verses, these are some examples, some examples of omitted verses in the NLT and also other versions. If you have an NIV or you have a TV or you have a whatever version, I want you to pull those out also and I want you to go check them out. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't, but at least you're going to understand where we're going with this. So if you have any other modern English version, Pull it out, check it out also. So I'd like to turn to the first verse, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. You're going to notice in the NLT, the verse does not exist. In the King James it says, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This verse is the conclusion of verses 14 through 20. It explains what to do. But you don't know what to do because the verse is not there. Let's go to another verse, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11. You're going to notice that in the NLT, this verse has been omitted. It's not in there. In the King James, it says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. This verse deals with why Jesus came. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. You're going to notice that in the NLT, this verse does not exist. It's been omitted. In the King James, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater condemnation. Jesus lists the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites. This omitted verse would expose the Catholic practice of paid prayers. Example, Masses. Let's go to the next verse, Mark chapter 7 and verse 16. You're going to notice the NLT does not have this verse, it's been omitted. In the King James it says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Probably thinking, so what if it's not there? What do you mean, so what? You're feeling good? In this verse, Jesus gives his final comment, hear and understand. But the NLT doesn't have that. Let's look at another verse, Mark chapter 9, verse 44. You're going to notice that the NLT, this verse has been omitted. What does it say in the King James? Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Go down a couple of verses, verse 46. You're going to notice the NLT does not have this verse. In 46 in King James it says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. These verses establish and deals with the unbeliever's final abode. These verses are talking about hell. You're going to notice if you do a study, when the scriptures speak twice and three times, that means God established it. That's what it is. There's nobody that's going to break it. 
Let's look at another verse, Mark chapter 11 and verse 26. You're going to notice that in the NLT, in the New Living Translation, the verse has been taken out, it's been omitted. But in the King James it says, If you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Why is this verse important? Verse 26 expounds and explains or clarifies verse 25. If you don't have verse 26, you cannot understand verse 25. You paid full price for a Bible, but you got verses missing. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 28 now, you're going to notice that the NLT, the verse is not there. It's been taken out. It's been omitted. In the King James, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. This verse deals with the fulfilled prophecy establishing Jesus as the Messiah. You don't have that verse, you cannot establish him as the Messiah. Maybe there's other verses, but this one would have been maybe the nail that would nail the coffin. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 36 now. You're going to notice that the NLT, the New Living Translation, omitted the verse. The King James, it says, Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. This verse furthers the point of verse 31. And here we are in verse 36, but you've got to go back to 31, and it furthers the actual point. If you're missing that verse, you're not getting the full picture, the full understanding of what Luke was trying to say to his readers. You've been shortchanged. And this is a clear version? Are you for real? Let's look at another one. Luke chapter 23 and verse 17. You're going to notice the NLT does not have this verse. Again, it's been omitted. The King James it says, For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. This verse explains a law in place at that time and clarifies the comment that's made in verse 18. Every verse is there for a reason. Why did they take these important verses out? And don't come and tell me, well, there's a footnote and it says the older manuscripts don't have this and whatever else it says, but that's another Bible study. I'm not going to get into that. The fact is, you don't have the verse in your Bible. And when you're reading your Bible, are you looking at the footnotes? If you're like me, I'm reading the text, I'm thinking, memorizing, and I'm meditating on God's Word. I'm not looking at whatever notes that they actually put in there. Let's look at another one, John chapter 5 and verse 4. Again, you're going to notice that the verse is missing. In the King James it says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water, whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. This verse explains and clarifies why all those people were at this particular pool. But if you don't have the verse, how do you want to understand that? Let's look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. Again, you're going to notice that the verse has been taken out of the NLT. And I hope that you got your Bibles out and you guys are looking at this yourselves. I've already did my homework. I know why I stand on the King James. I'm just showing you the material. That you believe it. That you don't believe it, it's no skin off my back. The King James, it says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Who? this is one of the heavy ones. This verse deals with what is needed to be baptized in the dispensation that these guys were in in Acts chapter 8. I'm not going to get into that because it's another theological discussion. But the fact is, is that this is what was needed for you to be baptized at that time. Let's look at one last verse. Acts chapter 28 and verse 29. Again, they don't have the verse in the NLT. The King James says, And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. This verse shows the reaction the Jews had to Paul's discourse. So what? Big tickle. No, if it's in there, it's in there for a reason. Now we're going to go after omitted words. The verse is there, but now they started omitting words. And again, I've really shortened this study. This study could have taken me three, four hours for the amount of information that I have. So like I was saying, we're going to be looking at omitted words now. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. It omits the word firstborn. Omitting this word concords with the Catholic teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Having the word firstborn concludes that Jesus was the first of other children born to Mary, thus not making her a perpetual virgin. So in the NLT it says, But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. They took off firstborn. And Joseph named him Jesus. The King James says, And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Here's an example of omitted clauses. Now there's clauses missing. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 now, what do they omit? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Modern Bibles, including the NLT and a whole bunch of other ones, they have a Catholic version of Jesus' prayer. In the NLT it says, And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. In the King James it's written, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Catholics stop there, but what does the Bible say? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Again, I'm not going to get into that. Go to Mark chapter 10 and verse 24. Here we're going to see that they omit for them that trust in riches. Omitting this clause concords with the Catholic teaching. Verse 23 says, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? In verse 24, Jesus clarifies the comment made in verse 23. Without this clause, wrong teachings will follow. The different Catholic orders, such as the nuns, the monks, the friars, the Jesuits, and the rest of them, they live under the vow of poverty, and their proof text that they're standing on is verse 23. Because for them that trust in riches has been taken out, they're living a lie. They're living under the vow of poverty when they don't have to be living under the vow of poverty. You see what happens when you start taking a word, a clause, or even a full verse out? All of a sudden now, it starts twisting the conclusions that you can come to. Now, I've added verse 23 for clarification and for the context. So the NLT says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God? This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. What does the King James say? And Jesus looked round about and saith unto the disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And his disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? Anybody can get into the kingdom of God. That you're rich, that you're poor, that you're middle class, that you're whatever. Anybody can get in there. But then that trust in their riches, especially the rich, they're the ones that are going to have a hard time getting into the kingdom of God. So, to finish it off, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? My next question is this. Do you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ? Basically that Jesus Christ is God. The NLT doesn't believe that. So how can you call yourself a Christian, but the book that you're holding does not believe it? Any other cult is going to come around, that they're the Jehovah's Witnesses, that they're the Mormons, that they're the Muslims. My friend, they're going to fry you up one side and down the other. I want you to turn to John 3.13. In this particular verse, very important words, which is in heaven. These are the four words that they've taken out. Now the omission takes the proof of Jesus' deity and it voids it. You just took it out of the scriptures. By reading the verse in the King James, you'll notice that Jesus is on earth and at the same time, he's in heaven. How can Jesus be on earth and in heaven at the same time? Because he is God. Because he's omnipresent. That's why he can do it. The omission of this clause brings Jesus down to man's level. From being deity, you just brought him down to man's level. And if you're trying to prove that Jesus Christ is God, and these words have been taken out, it ain't gonna happen. So being only in one place makes you a man. So this verse says that Jesus came down from heaven who is still in heaven. So let's look at the NLT, John 3.13. No one has gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. Simple enough. Look at the King James. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. Look at this. Which is in heaven. He came down, but he's still in heaven. Only God could do that. The minute you take that out, you just nullified the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's look at another verse on the deity of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16. We're going to be looking at the word God. They've changed the word. We're going to see it now in the context. So NLT, 1 Timothy 3.16. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and so on down the line. Let's read the King James. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Look at the NLT. Christ was revealed in a human body. I got a JW on my door and I'm slamming this thing between his freaking eyes. God was manifest in the flesh. Yeah, but we don't believe that. Have a nice day. What do you want me to tell you? The Muslims don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Here's a verse to prove to them that Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Do you believe it's the blood of Messiah, of Jesus, that gives us our redemption? Yeah? The NLT doesn't believe that because the NLT is an anemic Bible. It's missing blood. And the most important blood that redeems us, that covers me, all of a sudden has been taken out. You piece of filth. And you're telling me that that's a clearer Bible version? Are you people for real? Go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. Over here you're going to notice, through his blood has been taken out in the NLT. Who purchased our freedom 
and forgave our sins. And I hope you guys at home, you're actually flipping through your Bibles if you have an NLT or if you've got a modern version. I want you to go look at this. The King James says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Why did they take the blood out? Somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Somebody's trying to blind you. You have a faith that you believe and the book that you're holding in your hands does not believe it. Let me keep going. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? The NLT doesn't believe that. Oh really? Let me prove it to you. Go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. In this example you'll see word changes. The King James has Joseph and the NLT has Jesus' parents. This is what you're basically going to be seeing in the modern versions. So in other versions you might have his father. This word change attacks the virgin birth, rendering Jesus having parents or Joseph being Jesus's father and it does not make it constant with Mary being a virgin who was conceived of the Holy Ghost. So Luke 2.33 in the NLT says Jesus's parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Look at the King James and Joseph and his mother and this is what the right rendering should be. Joseph was not the father. Yeah but he was adopted. Okay okay let's get off of that argument. Joseph and his mother is the right rendering. So Joseph is the father in all of these modern versions. But when you're reading in the King James, Joseph is not the father. Because the way it's written, and Joseph and his mother, that's the way it's supposed to be written, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Question, do you believe in the Trinity? I do. Did you know that the NLT does not believe in the Trinity? So let's look at 1 John 5, 7. We're going to start reading in the NLT. So we have these three witnesses with a little dash. Good for you. That's very, very clear. In the King James, 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You believe in the Trinity, but you're holding a book that doesn't believe it. You believe in the virgin birth, and this book that you're holding in your hands doesn't believe it. You believe that Jesus Christ is God, and the book that you're holding in your hands doesn't believe that it's God. That's why the cults are having a heyday with you. I'm going to stop here. I can have hundreds of verses. This was just to dip your foot in the water, at least to see what they've done with this particular version. If you've got an ESV, you've got an NIV, which I call the HIV. If you've got any of these versions, just go check it out. So I'm going to stop it here. The NLT, as well as all the other versions, is a direct attack on the biblical fundamental doctrines of the Bible to the believer. You've been taught the basics, but the book that you're holding in your hands doesn't have it. We do what now with that? With what we just witnessed, these next comments from these people that endorsed the NLT. This is what they said. James Karsten, for me the greatest blessing of the NLT is how it opens up the meaning and impact of the scriptures to people. I think it's a wonderful translation and a gift to the church. A gift of what? Garbage! Are you for real? There's verses missing and it's a gift. Walt Kalstad, I would say without question that the accuracy <coughs> excuse me, of the New Living Translation and scholarship, scholarship, you've taken half the verses out, scholarship my eye. The scholarship that has gone into it has been impressive. I am freaking out for real. To me that's really impressive. Taking verses out, changing words, what we believe, what we stand on, this is the sh that you're cramming down the Christian's throats? Are you for real? And he says, I can trust it. Good for you. I'm really happy for you. What kind of a freaking Christian are you? Well, if I can say then, I would say without question, this guy never read the NLT. Because I don't think he ever would have written that if he's a true blue Christian. Gene Appel. Studying and teaching from the New Living Translation 2nd Edition provides refreshing insights from a translation with high credibility. Uh, Gene, did you go out to the bar last night? Did you write this on your hangover? Please forgive me speaking like this, but when I read stuff like this, it just blows me away. How can you say something, and this guy's supposed to be a preacher out there in California somewhere. Anyways, let me get off of that. Studying and teaching from the New Living Translation, second edition, provides refreshing insights from a translation with high credibility. Go kid your grandmother! Anybody that studies the scriptures and they see this stuff, they're going to say, this is not funny anymore. Who are you taking for a ride? Who are you working for? Satan? I recommend it to both Christian followers taking their first steps of the faith. That's right. Choke him right there and the guy's going to be dead. And seasoned veterans on their spiritual journey. Yeah, to hell. So let me ask you a question. What do you want to teach from the NLT? You just took out the virgin birth. You just took out his deity. You just took out the Trinity. And again, I'm just skimming over the top. 
What else did you assassinate in the actual doctrines in the Bible that the actual believer is actually standing on? And this is clear readability? Uh, no, not in my books. Gene, 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 how can you recommend this piece of trash to the body of Christ? You being a preacher, it makes me question what kind of a preacher you are. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the bull that they're feeding the body of Christ. And I think it's time to wake up. The reason I'm like this is because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord, He's my Savior. I've bowed the knee, I've bowed my head, and He is my God, He is my Lord. I've confessed the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I stand on. And when I see that they attack the Word of God like this, it just gets the better part of me. And I'm refraining from saying certain words, because a lot of this stuff is satanic, if you ask me. But I did not even go there. Guys, I gave you enough to basically wrap your head around this. Have yourselves a good week. May the Lord keep you, bless you, and Lord willing, we'll find ourselves here next week. Or like they say, here, there, or in the air. In the air. In the air. So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on His name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.